Hey guys, and welcome back to another ranking video right here on Tetrabit Gaming. It's been over two years since Cuphead came out, and in that time, many have gotten to love the game's aesthetic, bosses, and overall gameplay, myself included. Now, while I do enjoy the running gun stages, my favorite part of the game has always been the boss fights. Now, obviously, not all boss fights are equal. Some may be more interesting, dynamic, or just more difficult. I know there are several videos out there ranking based on difficulty alone, but in this video I'll be ranking all of the boss fights from worst to best based on a combination of how interesting the fight is, the boss's design, as well as my personal overall experience with them, difficulty included. For this list, I'll be leaving out all of the unused bosses. Sorry buddy. Since they may be properly added in the delicious Last Course DLC, which, depending on how many bosses get added, I may make a separate video on. But the rest of the lads and ladettes that are used in Cuphead are fair game. Anyways, enough talk. With all of that said, let's a go. Kicking things off, we have the stack of poker chips, Chips Bedigan. Can we all just take a second to appreciate just how awesome the name Chips Bedigan is? Anyways, being one of the sub-bosses from the King Dice battle, Chips is already a pretty short encounter by default, but he's definitely the easiest of the bunch. Just avoid the horizontally flying poker chips, there's really not too much to this fight. The weirdest thing about Mr. Chimes isn't his design, but how that claw is possibly holding him up. It's just a pretty simple fight, avoid the music notes and the slowly moving Mr. Chimes. By this point in the game, we've seen much worse bullet hell stuff. The memory game mechanic is a cool touch, though I don't really think it adds much to the fight at all. One thing I do really like is the claw game setting and the arcade casino-like background. Really makes me wonder if this was at all associated with the scrapped coin-op bop part of the game. If you haven't noticed yet, I'm basically grouping all of the King Dice sub-bosses together, since by being a sub-boss, they just aren't on the same level as a regular boss. Anyways, following the whole casino theme of the King Dice battle, the Pirouetta fight definitely checks off both things she's named after. There's not much to this fight, just parry the chips to jump over her and avoid the roulette balls. Do that, and this not-so-memorable fight will be over within a minute. While I do like the design of Pip and Dot, as well as the overall look of the monochromatic grey background with some slight colour accents, the fight is really basic. Jump over the moving spikes, avoid the slow-moving crystals and weird bird things, and don't hit the spikes on the back wall. That's it. Also, I just realized this fight really reminds me of that one Robotnik battle from Sonic CD. So that's kinda cool. Hocus Pocus is again another King Dice sub-boss, this time being a take on the classic rabbit in a top hat magic trick. There's not too much to say about this one either, he stays in place the whole fight, so it's pretty easy to keep fire on him with most weapons, and his attacks are generally pretty easy to avoid. The only hard part is avoiding the skulls when you get unlucky and the gap is on the bottom left or right. Overall, a not very memorable encounter. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Wheezy's his name, carcinogens are his game. There's again not too much to say about the actual fight here, as it's mostly just jumping from platform to platform while avoiding the demonic cigarettes in the middle, but I can just smell this area, and that just gives credence to the artwork here, as it definitely fulfills its purpose very well. Goupy Le Grand was the first boss I fought in this game, so I guess I give it a bit of a nostalgia bump for that. Being one of the first two boss fights you can choose, I get that it's supposed to be on the easier side, but either way, I think the overall design is just lacking, especially when compared to the other bosses in the game. It's just a pouncing ball of goop with a boxing glove. He does literally fight you from beyond the grave though, so points for that. Mangosteen is apparently not named after some pool reference, but instead the name derives from this exotic fruit, which I guess looks like an 8-ball? Anyways, this fight is another pretty straightforward King Dice battle, with the only obstacles being the bouncing cubes of Q-Chalk and Mangosteen himself, who opens a rift to some colorful dimension to summon some glowing orbs. The fight may not be all that engaging, but the design here is so simple, yet so unnerving at the same time. Like, look at this guy! I think the Tipsy Troop has the most individually unique attacks in a single fight out of all the King Dice sub-bosses. In addition to the martini glass spawning olive bats that shoot their eyes at you, you also have the decanter and glass spilling their drinks at you in different ways. 
Their design may not be anything more than just slapping some faces on bar equipment, but I have to give some extra points for the background. Different patrons will pop in and out, including some demons, horse skeletons, this walrus looking guy, a ghost. Being the second of the first two boss fights you can choose from, the root pack is also pretty easy overall. However, I do like the variety in this fight much more than with Goopy. This is the first time in the game we see several different bosses with their own segment, but other fights in this game just do it better, as each of these guys has a pretty easy attack to dodge. Oh yeah, and there's also that secret turnip phase, so points for that. Although the character designs themselves aren't anything too crazy, you gotta admit, a telekinetic carrot is pretty flippin' cool. Fearlap is, I think, my favorite of the King Dice sub-bosses. There's just a lot more going on with this fight. You got them sending evil exploding gifts filled with horseshoes at you, spooky jockeys riding below as if there's a horse race going on, and even some hooded racers who will fly at you, forcing you to keep an extra eye out for them. I also love the dead racehorse concept, the not-so-spooky bedsheet ghost spectators in the background, and the overall awesome-looking parallax scrolling of the background itself. It just makes the whole stage feel that much more alive even if everything's dead. I've personally never really been a fan of auto-scrolling levels, so I'm definitely biased with this one. And you don't even fight Rumor Honeybottoms at first, just some policeman bee schlub and some worker bees just trying to get back home after a long day at work. Sorry guys. I guess your experience with this fight varies depending on what weapon you use, as with most fights, but I usually use the Seeker weapon, so for most of the fight I just have to focus on jumping from platform to platform, and maybe parrying an incoming attack once in a while. The final phase is kinda cool, as she turns into a B-25 bomber, but I guess I feel that it's overshadowed by the not-so-special first two phases. Again, I had to decide to either keep the sub-bosses for this fight, or keep them separate, but I think each boss should have their own spot. Anyways, the actual battle with King Dice disregarding the board game is very straightforward. King Dice really only has one move, he moves a hand as if it were a bipedal creature, honestly this could have easily been a boss design on its own, as he makes a bunch of cards march at the player. Yeah, wild. I'm placing him a bit higher on this list due to his iconic design, importance in the game's plot, and I think he is certainly one of the bosses that's very memorable, and one that I usually think of when thinking about Cuphead. The fight with Grim Matchstick was when I realized just how hard this game can be during my first playthrough, especially the phase with the jumping fireball guys. Although I think the difficulty level for Grim is great, his design and the overall background isn't anything special. I do really like that he pulls off a three-headed Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon look for the last phase though. The battle with Ribby and Croak early on is the one that definitely sets the tone of what's to come for the rest of the game. Bonus points from me for referencing several things from the Street Fighter series here, like Ribby and Croak being dressed in similar colors to Ryu and Ken respectively, and also using this similar attack to reuse Hadouken. Also, apparently some believe the pair to be a reference to the Battletoads. After you dodge some Hadoukens and flaming bug things, Crokes will turn into a fan, and then finally both will combine to form a slot machine, because f*** it, why not? I don't know, I just love the weird shape-shifting here. Overall, a wacky fight that also really tests your dodging skills. You either like RNG in these fights, or you don't, and personally I'm not a big fan of leaving it to luck to determine a boss's fight difficulty, and that's kind of what you get with the first phase of Baroness Von Bon Bon. But on the other hand, I do like the variety each of the minions offers. We got Waffle Buddy, Gumball Bro, Candy Corn Lad, Gobstopper Guy, and of course Cupcake Chap, each with their own unique abilities and ways to harm the player. The final phase is also a big shift, as the castle will start crawling towards you viciously, while the Baroness literally throws her head at you. Thankfully, it's a no-brainer to dodge. The Hildeberg fight is the first of the airplane variety in the game, and oh boy is it a cool one. Hilda starts out as some weird helicopter, wind vane, unicycling blimp thing, but will then transform into one of three different cloud forms based on constellations, including Gemini, Sagittarius, and Taurus, each with their own style of attacks and behavior. 
Then, at the end, she will transform into a huge crescent moon, which takes up like half the screen. And I love its design both externally and internally. Also, UFOs. Those are cool. This fight is always frustrating for me since, again, I like using the seeking rounds, and the barrel usually ends up sucking most of them up, forcing me to use a different weapon. And this fight is definitely quite a challenge, as there are so many things you have to avoid. There's of course the barrel, and the captain's octopus shots, but then we also got the ship shooting cannonballs, a giant shark flopping onto the dock, a squid splatting out ink, and finally the ship's uvula firing out its giant laser. Speaking of which, I love that after a while, the ship just launches the captain and tries to take matters into its own hands. Best sharpen those dodging skills for this fight, you'll certainly need them. Ah, good old Beepus the Clown. The setting of this battle is another one I really like, I just love the whole carnival theme. Beppy also switches it up here a lot, from driving a bumper car, to turning into a balloon, to riding a goofy horse, and then finally turning into an entire carousel ride thing. All the while, you have to keep dodging ducks, penguins, these inflatable balloon dogs, and of course, the roller coaster which constantly moves below. I really like Beppy's design as the balloon and ride, but the other ones just aren't quite as unique. The Calamaria fight has a lot going for it. I really like her design in all three phases of the fight, and I think the transition from the first setting to the coral-filled cavern is awesome. However, there's one thing I really don't like, and that's her blasts, which turn you into stone and renders you immobile for a few seconds. Now this effect is fine on its own, but the blast is essentially impossible to dodge, and it leaves you stunned for a few seconds and open to get easily hit by an oncoming obstacle. And this makes getting hit feel quite cheap at times. That said, if you don't really care about getting a flawless S rank here, the awesome bullet hell sections and creative use of the fish and snake hair is really cool, and I think it makes this battle very entertaining visually and in terms of gameplay. Jimmy the Great offers another awesome airplane level with a whopping 5 phases. Although I feel flying through the pillars in the second phase kind of slows down the pacing of the fight, the other phases definitely make up for it. Everything from launching his flaming skull at you to Illuminati pyramids and peeping from some interdimensional portal in his sarcophagus. There's also another hidden phase that was added in this fight in the form of a mini version of Cuppet or Puphead. Like how could you not give bonus points for this little guy? Phantom Express is one of the last contracts the player has to complete before paying the last visit to King Dice. And this fight I find pretty easy, which is surprising given how late it is in the game. Well, at least the first few phases are easy, the skeleton is easy to dodge, as are whatever these are. The last phase is a bit harder, as I always find it hard to focus on hitting the heart while also dodging the tiny fireballs and the bone ring. I really like the whole Halloween setting of this fight, as well as the variety in the phases. I don't know, there's just something about having to blast the heart of a locomotive in its boiler. It feels almost poetic. And of course, we can't forget the cart, which is another unique mechanic that I think just makes this fight stand out that much more. Sally Stage Play's design isn't anything crazy at first, just a couple about to be wed, with the husband cowering in the background as he may or may not soon meet his demise. What I love most about this fight is that it has as much side lore in it as we see in this game, as we go from the wedding to either the nunnery or Sally's house, and then to fight the couple in an afterlife setting, before finally concluding with the audience giving everyone a standing ovation for their performance. I also really, really like the secret alternate path that was added to this fight by standing on these angels in the first phase. I really hope more fights have secret paths like this in the game's upcoming DLC. Yeah, yeah, as much as I like Plant Boy, I unfortunately don't think this fight is the best in the game. Cagney starts out as a cute, happy, innocent looking flower, and then BAM! We in this now, boys, no pooping around. This guy's gonna shoot falling seeds like a Gatling gun, maximally extend his face, shoot boomerang like seeds, and try to grab you with his vine. Oddly, despite the name, Cagney Carnation looks nothing like a carnation. The fact that we go from this to this just goes to show how dynamic the boss designs in this game can be, and I think this is one of the best examples of that. A killer plant, huh? What's next? A Great War rat driving a makeshift tank made out of a soup can? Yes. The fight with Werner Vermin sets you inside a rat hole as you fight him and his many contraptions, including killer bottle cap saws. 
Then eventually the looming cat will bust the wall down and eat Werner before proceeding to try and eat the player as well. The ghosts of rats the cat has eaten before will also emerge, which I thought was a really cool and dark touch. Then, in a twist of irony, after defeating the cat, its face slides off, and it is revealed that the cat was just another one of Werner's inventions. Great setting, awesome fight, and I thought the twist at the end was amazing. But wait, does that make Werner a cannibal for eating those fellow rats? I need some answers. Okay, so you fought through all 26 of the other bosses, and defeated King Dice at his own game. Now time for the final challenge fighting the devil himself. Although I don't think it's the toughest fight in the game, this battle will definitely put everything you've learned in this game to the test. The devil has a variety of interesting attacks like launching his head at you in spider form, turning into a ram, a dragon, and then ditching his skin and becoming a skeleton before transitioning to the next phase, where he is absolutely massive and will take up pretty much most of the screen as the platforms drop off one by one. The whole hell setting is really visually appealing, and I think this fight certainly feels like a fitting climax for the game. I love the airplane boss fights in this game, and this one is no exception. I don't know what it is, but I just find something so satisfying about dodging all these feathers in this phase. I also really like the variety in all the phases in this fight. From Wally being stuck in a cuckoo clock, to fighting his jerk son, and finally finishing him off in a stretcher being lifted by some medic birds. The fight with Wally's son kinda sucks, but I think the other two phases more than make up for it. There's also literal chicks with nails strapped to their head. What's not to love? Much like many of the other bosses in this game, Dr. Call and his robot can be seen as a reference to many other popular forms of media. The robot appears to take inspiration from the likes of the Iron Giant, Bender, and or the robot from Queen's News of the World album. There also appears to be references to Mega Man enemies, and Dr. Call himself in the last phase appears to be a reference to the likes of a mix of Dr. Wily, Dr. Robotnik, and Bowser in his clown car. I also really like that the first phase has you targeting the robot's brain, heart, and gut, which can also be seen as a reference to the Wizard of Oz. Sporting an awesome dystopian wasteland of a background, numerous references to other media, the design of the robot and Dr. Call, and just being one heck of a boss fight makes this to be what I think is the best boss fight in Cuphead. And there you have it guys, my list of every current boss in Cuphead from worst to best, and I hope you enjoyed. What are some of your favorite and least favorite bosses in the game? Let me know down in the comments. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of my other countdown and ranking videos by clicking on the card right here. Swing by my other social media things, which are all linked below, and if you want to support the channel, check out my snazzy merch at tetrabitgaming.com, or consider becoming the latest member of the Tetrabit Squad. Click on the join button below for more information. Anyways guys, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you in a bit.